this is a, a really important story that a 10 year old um, was pregnant at all. Then that a 10 year old had to travel across state lines to access an abortion. Then that a fact checker at the Washington Post suggested that this story wasn't true. Let's go through what the story is, uh, what really happened, and then how it was reported on. Laura, you have a piece that you wrote at the Neiman Lab. It's called Unimaginable Abortion Stories Will Become More Common. Is American Journalism Ready? In America, after the end of Roe v. Wade, one brave source on the record is often the best we're going to get. Countless other stories will never be told. So can you tell us how you heard about this story? Sure, yeah. So um, I read the column in the Washington Post, um, which is by their columnist, Glenn Kessler, who does sort of fact checking the news type of column. He basically called into question the story had, that had appeared in a local newspaper, the Indianapolis Star, about um, a 10 year old who had um, allegedly gone um, crossed state lines to receive an abortion. She had to travel to Indiana to get it because it wasn't legal in Ohio where she lived. So the source on the record in that story, so meeting the person who was um, saying that this had happened, um, was the doctor who performed the abortion on the 10 year old. She used her real name. She said um, she said that this had happened and, and that this, this patient had traveled to her and that she was 10 years old. The column that originally ran in the Washington Post by Glenn Kessler, their columnist, called it a one source story. So meaning like the only person speaking on the record um, is one person um, and wrote the only source cited for the anecdote was Bernard, the doctor who performed the abortion. When I saw that, I s- sort of immediately little alarm bell went off because like the doctor on who is using her real name going on the record saying that she performed the abortion like that's a great source like that's a solid that's really solid that's not like a he said she said kind of thing so that was what first um that was what first got my attention and then you wrote to him right um you wrote to glenn kessler yeah, so I decided that I would report on the story. Um, I, I noticed I noticed this column, and then um, I think like maybe the day after it came, maybe the day a couple of days after the column came out, um, we started hearing from the reporters who had who had worked on the original story at the, that the Indianapolis Star that um, there was indeed this this court case where um, somebody had raped a ten year old and. Um, and so it, the story that he had called into question was, um, was proven true. Um, and I, I just wanted to write about it right away. So at that point, it had, it had sort of been picked up um, by a lot of conservative media. Glenn Kessler's column is an example of, um, you know, just like the Wall Street Journal called it a, a story to like an abortion story too good to be true, um, as in like, this seems so awful. Like this seems so, you know, like the exact kind of thing that like pro-choice people are arguing will happen if abortion rights fall in this country, um, you know, too good to confirm, um, which is just a really crazy thing to say. So um, that column in the Washington Post kind of opened the door to these other takes from the conservative media sort of casting doubt on the story. Then here's a Fox News uh, headline, Biden cited story of a 10 year old Ohio rape victim needing abortion, still not verified by fact checkers. And then you quote uh, Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost ta- telling USA Today's Ohio Network Burr on Tuesday, uh, every day that goes by, the more likely that this is a fabrication. I know the cops and prosecutors in this state. There's not one of them that wouldn't be turning over every rock looking for this guy and they should have charged him. Uh, shame on the Indianapolis paper that ran this thing on a single source who has an obvious ax to grind. So you then emailed Kessler and uh, he told you this story is an interesting example of how news can be widely shared these days. It was picked up by outlets around the world and it was based on one source, someone who was an activist in one side of the debate without an apparent effort to confirm it. This fact check added more context than was updated once there was a new development. So he's framing the doctor as an activist? Right. Um, So I got in touch with him after the follow-up stories had come out, um, confirming that this was true and that this had happened. Um, And that was the point 
where he gave me uh, that quote that you just saw on the screen. And uh, Andrew, what made you interested in the story? I think it was actually that quote. Um, you know, I'd seen the column. Uh, and then when I saw him give that quote to, to Laura and to Neiman Lab, I just thought it was a pretty, uh, pretty insane take altogether. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, this, this doctor had to be lying um, is, is just pretty, pretty ridiculous, right? Like, it's so, so someone really put their neck out there to, to share this story and to, and to like, just, you know, uh, denigrate them, the, the, the person that way just made me feel um, pretty skeptical. Um, and, you know, him also saying that, like, that there was no effort to verify. Um, I'm not really sure he has any clue what, what effort there was to verify at the Indianapolis Star or the, the, the paper that subsequently reported the, um, the, you know, the new news here that there had been arrest, an arrest made. Like those reporters all seem to go, um, their, their process seemed to be a lot, uh, you know, more thorough uh, than, than anything uh, Glenn Kessler decided to throw at them in this fact checker column. And so then you, what did you do? So in his column, and actually like in his, in the original column, he said that um, none of the county officials he contacted were aware of um, such a case in their areas, um, you know, both in like Columbus and Toledo, Cleveland, et cetera. Um, and then he updated his column to say that, um, that the Fra Franklin County officials did not offer a response when he reached out to them unlike other Ohio County agencies. So I wanted to see if that was true. Um, and, you know, what, what we found is that that was not true at all. Um, the Franklin County officials did reach out, did reply to him, did respond. And what they told him is that they wouldn't be able to comment on specific cases because there's a, a, there are restrictions under um, Ohio law pertaining to, ch to child cases. Um, and, you know, that that sort of stands to reason, right? Like you would expect that. Um, you you would you would definitely expect uh, child services cases to be considered um, confidential in you know under many state laws, and, and I think there are some like federal statutes here too. Um, but you know, and what we ended up hearing from the post was that um, that he had actually missed this email. So first, you have the email from Glenn Kessler. It says, I, I read a column in which I try to verify facts in the news. You may have seen the reports about a 10-year-old who was raped and needed an abortion and was forced to travel to Indiana. The article is based on a statement by a doctor who claims to have treated the child, but no other information was provided. My understanding was that under Ohio law, any knowledge of such a case would need to be reported to child services. So this is a bit of a shot in the dark, but have you heard of any such recent case in Franklin County? I'm checking with other large counties as well. Thank you, Glenn Kessler. And then the response, good morning, Mr. Kessler. You are correct that a physician as a mandated reporter under Ohio revised code 2151.421 would be required to report any case of known or suspected physical, sexual, or emotional abuse or neglect to their local child welfare or law enforcement agency. Children's services agencies are prohibited from sharing information regarding specific cases. Children's services agencies always wish to protect and respect the privacy of those we serve. Thank you. I think that says it all, right? Like they, they say pretty flatly, like they, they cite several statutes saying they would not be able to talk about this. So there, there are laws on the books barring uh, ch children's service agencies from sharing this information. But he, for some reason, thought that uh, he was going to get them to share that information by, um, you know, cold emailing them, asking them if they'd ever heard about a, a, a case in their area with where a child was victimized. Um, it's, it's just what an insane process here, right? Like I, there was nothing he was going to find, but instead he, you know, raised all these questions that then got weaponized by, by conservative media. Andrew, by the way, how did you get your hands on those emails? I filed a request to um, the Franklin County Children's Services, just asking them for any correspondence between their public information office and, and Glenn Kessler, um, like in the days around the days where he filed his column. Mm -hmm. Um, and they got back to us relatively quickly. We didn't even, we didn't pay anything for it. Um, you know, we ended up going to other County agencies now too, and we're, we're waiting on those requests. Um, but you know, another one of the requests we found, um, someone said like, we haven't heard about this case, but if we had, we wouldn't be able to talk about it with you. So he, he should have very well known that there were um, uh, like confidentiality restrictions here that should most certainly have been mentioned in his column because, um, though, you know, it would also sort of negate the entire premise. And if you go to The Washington Post now, it still says a one story source about a 10 year old and an abortion goes viral. 
and it then it does under the headline and under the uh, the quote from Biden, uh, it does have update and arrest has been made in this case, providing additional confirmation, more details below. But it's still fairly misleading. I mean, the headline in itself is fairly misleading. Yeah, this shit should have been taken immediately off the website. Um, yeah, it, it should. It, in fact, it should just never have been published. Like they they really. Like it's it's kind of remarkable from like conception to execution that this piece was you know uh, conceived, uh, written, edited, and pu and published to the web and allowed to stay on, especially after the you know the news that we that we've like since heard that that someone was arrested for committing this crime. Conservatives like are definitely not going back to like assess how they handled this. Like in fact, like what you saw like right after that is they started like. Uh, you know, like weaponizing uh, like the person's like immigration status who committed this crime. Um, right. Like that's that's where they went. Right. It's not like, oh, like, how did how did I screw up? It's like, what what next can we attack? It's not that's that's just like clearly what was going to happen. Um, and yeah, I don't I don't think many of those people stopped to read uh, either of our stories or uh, the, the Washington Post's, you know, sort of ham handed updates and corrections. Then I, of course, heard people who had said it wasn't true. And then they, when they had to backtrack and say, OK, it, w it was true, they were like, oh, but that's why it's so terrible that these journalists in the initial case reported this way because we had to doubt it. Of course, we were going to doubt it. But I think that one of the really important things about your piece, Laura, um, which you kind of also back up, Andrew, is that reporting in the time of like post row is going to be different or going to present certain challenges. Right. So um, if you're doing something, if people are doing something that is now, if people are getting an abortion and that's now illegal in their state, then that means they're technically criminals who are not going to want to um, give their names because what they're doing is illegal, whether they're getting the abortion or whether they're providing the abortion. Um, so how do you report those stories? I mean, if you want these, if you want to tell the stories of the, the women and the children who are getting abortions and you're going to have to figure out a way to do it if you think it's an important story, um, then you may have to reconsider some of the sort of like journalistic conventions that were taught, which are things like everybody has to be on the record. There are, you know, there are two sides for every story. The other thing I think that I've thought about a lot is like um, Kessler's use of the word activist to describe the doctor who performed the abortion um, so does getting a, an abortion now mean you're an activist and you need to have, there needs to be like a pro-life activist on the other side saying it didn't happen. It just doesn't, like, it doesn't make sense. And when you, when you start to think about this fitting into that sort of like traditional journalistic framework, it just starts to seem, I mean, you start to see it's kind of impossible and crazy. Um, so like journalists definitely still need to do the work. They need to make sure that their reporting is true. But sometimes like you're, you're not going to have that sort of like airtight, like I talk, spoke to X, Y, Z, like full name, age X, who lives in, you know, X state where abortion is illegal. It's just not going to, it's not going to work that way. And like, right. otherwise you're not going to be telling these women's stories. Glenn Kessler, I has done this a lot. He's, his fact checking has been called into question a lot. I don't know. I'm not in his mind, but I could imagine that this is something he just didn't want to be true and like let that desire or his view of abortion providers as activists guide his his alleged fact checking. And it's really scary when the people who are supposed to be doing the fact checking and objective are either, you know, emotionally invested or ide ideologically invested. I don't know Glenn Kessler's politics. I haven't read a ton of his stuff. What I would say is that since this story came out, there have been so many other stories about, um, again, quote unquote, unbelievable abortion stories, women being forced to carry um, fetuses that will not survive um, to term, you know, like, I mean, they're just all these stories are coming out. And so I think that things that people maybe didn't more many more things that people didn't want to think were possible um are gonna are gonna come out um, i think that's happening now yeah what are you guys working on now uh well i i'm contacting the other county agencies and waiting to hear back from uh at least one more i'm like very curious to see going forward so um 
what I technically cover and what we write about at Neiman Lab is innovation and journalism. Um, and I'm really curious to see sort of how this um, story is, these stories are told going forward when abortion is going to be illegal in many states. Um, I, I think that this this whole little um, saga serves as kind of a warning sign for how like this some reporting can go wrong. I also think it's a great example of like why we need local journalists because they are the ones um, in Ohio and Indiana who broke the story. Um, there was, it was one of the ones who broke the story was the only reporter in the courtroom um, when this this man who raped the 10 year old was accused. Um, like we need those lo local reporters on the ground telling these stories. Um, and so I'm, I'm you know, interested to see how that goes.